Splitting the Sky is a Mohawk activist, writer, and actor with the background of orphanages and school boards, uh, boarding schools. Splitting the Sky emerged as a principal participant in the New York State Attica Prison Rebellion at the age of 19. He later became active in the American Indian Movement. He has engaged in numerous armed standoffs with both U.S. and Canadian authorities. Where they were armed, he wasn't. <laughs> including, in our own backyard here, Gustafson Lake standoff in 1995. Uh, well, thank goodness this man has lived, to sur uh, has survived and lives to tell the tales. Um, in 2001, he published the autobiography of Splitting the Sky from Attica to Gustafson Lake. There are copies here and a tremendous read. I encourage that in, on, in, in your library. Uh, now a leading 9-11 truth researcher, advocate, and speaker, Splitting the Sky was arrested in, and jailed in Calgary, Alberta in March 2009 when he attempted to place former U.S. President George W. Bush under citizen's arrest. March 17, 2009. Former President George W. Bush visits Calgary to make his first speech since leaving the White House. The event was by invitation only and was closed to the media. Many people called for his arrest. Splitting the Sky was charged with obstructing a peace officer in the execution of his duty. But in reality, the peace officer was obstructing him. What you, what you really don't see there, in these particular clips, you don't see the amount of snipers all up on the buildings with sniper rifles, balaclavas, guerrilla gear. And you know that not only does Bush travel with Secret Service as an ex-president, but he also travels with a private assassination squad known as Blackwater. And I'm sure you all know about Blackwater. Of course now, because they've killed so many people and they're under so much investigation in Iraq right now, and that the leader is accused of murder himself, murdering people that were blowing the whistle, his own Blackwater troops blowing the whistles on the, on the 17 known murders they committed in Iraq that they're being investigated in right now and, and about ready to face trial. But the fact was, now they, I guess they figured, well, well, we'll get rid of that bad name, the Blackwater, and we'll, we'll, we'll try to conceal ourselves. They call ourselves Z. 
And when I think of Z, I think I want to go to sleep. You know, you get some Zs and you want to go to sleep. So you want to put the people to sleep, you know, because you get uh, somebody by the name of Charles Manson, right, uh, that ordered the killings of so many people, a mass murder, and all of a sudden you want to turn around and call him Lolita. You know, that doesn't change the fact that he killed so many people as a mass murderer. But, of course, he wants you to make him believe that he's got a new name, that he's got a new, he's got a new history. Um, <clears throat> I have to say that my understanding, my, my basic feeling about George Bush was for all this, the images that you and I were bombarded with for the last eight years during his administration. And we saw the amount of people that were killed, that were apprehended post 9-11, um, going into Iraq and Afghanistan. And we had to look at the amount of people that were abducted by Blackwater assassination, private assassination squads, and other assassination squads that were outsourced by the U.S. government and paid as private independent contractors. And so we, you and I, got a very horrible look at the amount of people that were being taken out, abducted from their homes, Muslim men, mostly men, and women and children were being uh, forced to watch the men abducted, handcuffed, hooded, beaten, and killed on the spot if there was any level of resistance. And then we eventually saw these people being taken out by the hundreds and thousands in the so-called war against terrorism, a post-9-11 phase that came into being. And we watched these people being hauled in front of us, and, and we even watched Canada's JTF-2 grabbing them and turning them over to the United States to be taken to Guantanamo Bay you would be taken to Bagrab and Abu Ghraib. So we, we, we know, and we saw the images of people being tortured, being forced to be naked, being forced to have unnatural sexual activities, being forced to be in stress positions. Then we started hearing about these horrible things being waterboarded. And then as we go along, we find out all the different forms. There was a hundred different forms of atrocities that were being perpetuated on these people. Then we started finding out that many of these people, like predominantly a fellow by the name, a Muslim fellow by the name of Al Libby. I forget how to say his first name. But Al Libby was forced into waterboard. He was waterboarded 182 times in order to put the finger on Khalid Sheikh Mohammed to say that he was the one that masterminded 9-11. Now, you know, initially, after 9-11, the U.S. sent its troops with the coalition of the killing, I mean, excuse me, the willing, or is it the willing for killing? The coalition. While well, we got all the rest of the people in the world that were so upset about the murders committed by Arabs that knocked out the Twin Towers, brought those towers down and killed 3,000 people plus. So the world is totally angry, mad, ready to go to war on terror, to fight a war against terrorists. And of course, we were told they were Muslims from Saudi Arabia. And so... Now, we see all these images of people being tortured. And at first, we, we, we find out that we're supposed to be going into Afghanistan to apprehend a guy by the name of Osama bin Laden hanging out in caves with the rest of Al-Qaeda cells. And they're over there in the caves, man, getting ready to, they've declared war on the U.S. and, 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 and North America because they just don't like our democracy. They don't like our way of life. So these are the justifications we're given post 9-11. Then all of a sudden, as they're making these bombing raids, and I can just tell you right now, because I'm just going to fill in the blanks for the sake of times, the only way they had already been into Afghanistan, they tried to negotiate deals with the Taliban to move in to get control of their opium crops, as well as access to the pipelines from the Caspian Sea Basin, 
where Chevron and BP, Exxon Mobil, and uh, uh, Dutch Royal and Alberta Oil have major claims in the Caspian Sea. But of course, we're going over there to apprehend terrorists so that we can export democracy while well, we exported tons and tons of bombs. Because the Taliban says we're not going to get involved. No, we're not going to let you come in and access our pipelines and run them through Afghanistan into Pakistan and or run them through the, the Baku, Tbilisi, Kahan pipelines going through Georgia, Russia, into Russia, and other pipelines going in, I forget the name of it at the moment, going into China. So what we got is we got major, uh, major economic interest in that region for oil and gas. And the pipeline going from Afghanistan down through Pakistan into India to uh, 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 Dabol, I forgot how to say it, Dabol, but it was Enron that was producing energy down in Dabol, India, that they wanted to get this, uh, Cheney and Bush wanted to get that particular pipeline to for their friend Ken Lay. In any event, the only way that they could get in there is if there was a friendly, there was a legitimate government that was established and that they could get the sanction for them to come into their country. So when they put it through the Taliban, hey, uh, you let us in, we'll pave your streets with gold. If you don't let us in, we're going to bomb you into oblivion. We're going to bomb you into oblivion. And they made these talks right over there, Crawford, Texas. They had these talks beforehand. As a matter of fact, Tony Blair and uh, 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 Bush, the whole Bush gang, were there with Dick Cheney and made these negotiations there and gave them this ultimatum. Well, the Taliban went back and they said, the heck with you, we're not doing business with you, we're a sovereign people, and no, we don't want to start growing poppies, heroin again, because we completely got eradicated it. And now today, according to Peter Dale Scott, there's 95% of the opium and heroin markets are back up again post 9-11. And then as well, they start moving all this gas and oil through the pipelines and have got control of it. Of course, there are major comp competing factors, the Chinese, the Russians, the Iraqi, uh, the Iranians, and the, uh, and the U.S., China, uh, the U.S., Great Britain, and Israel. There's major contention for those resources there, which could get very troublesome there very soon. So... Here we go. The only way they could then legitimize the government was to depose the Taliban and prop up another one. And the way they did that, of course, is they had us believe that this guy named Osama bin Laden was, was hitting us on 9-11. They hit us from the outside with 19 Arabs with box cutters and defeated in three hours, defeated the world's greatest military defense defeated the world's greatest air force defense with just box cutters and knives, little butter knives. If you believe that, man, there's lots of things. There's a, lot, a bunch of bridges I'm trying to get rid of right now, and I need the money now, for real. So here, all of a sudden, you're going to look at, oh, he's hiding in a cave with all the rest of his Al-Qaeda buddies. Oh, yeah, he's hiding in a cave, all right. Well, that gives us a, a reason to invade. A national emergency has been declared. They're allowed to go in with all the military forces, with all the coalition of the killing, and they start bombing the hell out of Afghanistan. Boom, 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 boom. People are getting killed by the thousands, being abducted and seized by the thousands, tortured and murdered by the hundreds. And then... Oh, of course, they can never find no bin Laden or the cells. Well, of course, they find innocent Muslim men and women and children that they abduct and they put into prisons and torture and murder. But no, no Osama bin Laden. Well, that was the convenient excuse to go in there to bomb the Taliban, to wipe them out, deliver the carpet of bombs they promised if they didn't do business with them and install their puppet government, Hamid Karzai, who happened to be 
a, an executive of Unicall. And Unicall plays very prominent with Dick Cheney and Henry Kissinger, the Rockefellers, and, uh, and all the other peoples involved, on inter- and many other peoples involved on international levels. So my initial feeling was, when I looked at all of those men being dragged through with hoods and forced to sit in stress petitions, uh, positions and eventually after being tortured and I'm watching all these people going into Guantanamo Bay and there's just this complete there's the complete execution of these poor individuals that are being blamed for which I believe was a bogus war it was an orchestrated war it was designed to deceive the world so that they could justify an incursion into the Mideast to fulfill the mandate of the project for a new American century. And you and I know that basically this project for a new American century was designed and orchestrated and drafted and signed by a number of peoples including Dick Cheney, Cheney, Scooter Libby, Douglas Fife, Paul Wolfowitz, Richard Pearl, a whole gambit of people. These people basically put this together in order to say, look, the only way we're going to advance our military, the only way we're going to be able to justify the military budgets is to be able to create some kind of war. Of course, now the war against the communists, the Cold War had subsided, so we're told. So there really is no need to send in, you know, no troops internationally without getting the American people saying, hey, or, or the Congress to say, hey, no, we're not going in, we're not going to sub, we're not going to put up in the draft of the Project for New American Century, they're basically, we're calling for $96 million, a billion dollars. But I think they got something like 100 times that after 9-11. Because Lougheed Martin, Raytheon, Boeing, all of these big military Carlisle group, all these big, uh, big war <coughs> L3 communications, which, by the way, that same, uh, they produce that West camera that oversees and allows the drones to hit from the air, remote control killing, which uh, Obama is, is, is just bombing the hell out of everybody in the same fashion right now with massive military buildups in Afghanistan and Pakistan. So what do we got? So what do we got? So the L3 communications is the same as the same Ines guy they use against us, a handful of natives up at Gustafson Lake in 1995. But that's another story you can look up at another time. So here we got the need to justify billions of dollars, billions of dollars, trillions of dollars to go to the military. And then we find out the day before 9-11, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, we find out uh, Donald Rumsfeld comes out and tells us, hey, oh, yeah, by the way, there's $2.3 trillion missing from the Pentagon budget. We don't know where it's at. Boom, the next day, you got 9-11. Yeah, and people miss that. People miss that. Two point, now, what, where do you lose $2.3 trillion? Where did it go? Where's the accountability? Where's transparency? Where is it? Where did it go? And so what did I say? And what am I saying to all this? I'm saying that I've dug up over the years. Now, uh, uh, funny enough, it was only a year ago. It was exactly a year ago today that I gave this talk over here in Victoria <clears throat> called 9-11 Follow the Money. In that talk, I outlined 38 major corporations that benefited from put option stock trading prior to 9-11, totaling billions of dollars. And, <clears throat> and of course, I uh, continue to do research. I haven't stopped researching 9-11 for eight years. <clears throat> I never really came out on 9-11. Is that my water there? <clears throat> Until uh, I met with Wayne Prunty here, and we did a thing at the... Uh, what was it? the Peace Arch? What did you call it? The conversions? The truth conversions. Yeah, truth conversions at the Peace Arch. And again, I was still coming out with just information. 
<clears throat> digging up information. But uh, what I did do is I dug up, I got a list of the 38 corporations that benefited uh, from the trades. The trades in blood, because people knew beforehand that some of these corporations were going to go down and others were going to go up. And some of the corporations that I identified was AIG, American International Group, insurance company, that after 9-11, they received billions of dollars, not only in put option stock trading, but they also advanced their international interest around the world with insurance companies, they were able to sell security to people of the whole world that had been terrorized by the sight of nothing less than the worst snuff movie on 9-11. So people, there was the biggest insurance bonanza in the world. So AIG, Maurice Hank Greenberg, was behind one of the key players, along with Larry Silverstein, who put in $14 million just six weeks before to buy the leases for the twins and also six weeks with the uh, inclusion that there'd be a terrorist clause, just happened to be six weeks beforehand, with the Blackstone Group, which put up $111 million with Silverstein. And the Blackstone Group was owned and controlled by a guy named Schwartzman. Stefan Schwartzman, but most predominantly his partner, who was Pete Peterson, former head of the Council on Foreign Relations, as well as the, uh, uh, the president of the New York City Federal Reserve. So now I get, I get AIG, Hank Greenberg, then I find out about his son, Jeffrey Greenberg, who was the CEO of Marsh and McLellan. And then they benefited from the put option stocks. And then there was this organization called Kroll Security. So now, as I'm going through my research, I find two things in my research that really, when it all boils down to it, constitutes major prima facie evidence, confessions, that should automatically, that, that actually the one has been investigated but got lost by the FBI. Nobody's investigating it anymore, but it was supposed to be investigated. And the other was a, a precondition before all that happened, a statement. But let me give you a statement by a fella by the name of um, um, Richard Andrew Groves. Oh, here it is right here. Okay, this is uh, Richard Andrew Groves, and he gave this statement to someone. I'm not sure who it was at this point, but this is January 9, 2009. Richard Grove used to work for Silver Stream Software on the 98th floor of the World Trade Center, won an exposed insider trading between a few, company, a few companies also based in a WTC, Marsh McLellan, AIG, and Silver Stream. He broke down the information into an auto recording back in 2006 that he called Project Consolation after the style of a visual works by suicided artist Mark Lombardi. Okay, now his quote. <clears throat> in 2000, I worked for a software development entity called Silverstream Software. I worked in sales and in, Oct in October of that year, I won the largest client in company history which soon after led the acquisition, the acquisition of Silverstream by Novell. Now, footnote about Novell. Novell, does anyone know who owns Novell? Novell is owned by hedge fund billionaire George Soros. All right, in contextual hindsight, and considering the audience, my Gordon Geico was a client named Marsh and McLellan. Marsh is the world's largest insurance brokerage. You might also recall that Marsh, Marsh was located right below Cantor Fitzgerald in the North Tower. And, approximate, and, and approximately 295 Marsh employees were murdered that morning along with the other innocent victims and employees who either knew too much or too little about their chosen work environment. 
SilverStream technology was the was on the cutting edge of internet solutions, offering software to web enable the critical business functions of Fortune 500 companies. Basically, integrating and making available on the web the disparate legit, uh, legacy applications and mainframes while simultaneously streamlining workflow and traditional paper, pro paper processes with an end result being a lower cost of operation and more efficient transactions. Because inefficiencies such as people, such as people being taken out of the loop, and here's where it gets interesting. Silverstream had built had built internet transactional and trading platforms for Merrill Lynch, Deutsche Bank, Bankers Trust, Alex Brown, Morgan Stanley, to name a few. I was responsible for these accounts at one time or another. Coincidentally, several of these companies purchased space in the World Trade Center and simultaneously completed disaster recover and recovery and business continuous impact implementation just prior to 9-11. And hopefully you're already familiar with the roles that these financial institutions played on 9-11. And if you include Marsha McLellan and another client of mine in, the, in 2001, AIG on the list, you pretty much have the major players involved in the financial aspect of 9-11 fraudulent trading activity. You might have also noticed the hidden, hidden information regarding Marsh on the bottom half of the screen, approximately six and a half minutes into loose change. Okay, what does that say? This guy here has just, tell, just told the whole world. He just admitted he's the one that moved all the money through the Silverstream software into international accounts worldwide. Of the billions of dollars that were traded, put option stock traded prior to 9-11. Not just minutes or hours. We're talking about weeks and possibly months. And what happens? He's admitting he was the one that ran the money through that. There's enough information in that particular statement to call for an SEC investigation, to call for a joint congressional investigation in the FBI, to call for charges from the FBI to look into the activities because one of the main characters that benefited was Alex Brown, a guy by the name of Puzz Buzzy Krogard, who was the third in charge of the CIA. These guys, he's admitting these guys were behind bringing those towers down. They knew they were coming down. They knew they were coming down, and they gambled on the lives of nationals from 92 different countries, including 25 Canadians who are dead today because somebody decided they were going to bring those towers down. Because these are the people that should have been, they were supposed to have been indicted or looked into an investigation by the FBI and also by Crow Security. But Crow Security also happened to be owned by would take it over. Jerome Howard was one of the initial uh, 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 persons that was the head of security from Crow that allowed all these people to come into those buildings and set charges on all these different floors with these different corporations to allow those squibs you see to go blowing off. Now, I want to also let you know that in my investigation, I found out predominantly from the, the works of Kevin Ryan. You know who he is. You know who Kevin Ryan is. He's very, he's a prolific 9-11 truther and writer. Kevin Ryan basically makes the connection of the Twin Towers with Bush interest, the Bush family interest, predominantly with all of the, uh, all of the buildings, all of the floors controlled by Dresser Industries. Does anybody know who they are? All right, Dresser Industries was basically, and that's funny because years ago I, 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 I ran across some, an article on Dresser Industries. These guys create pipelines. They also do building fittings, pipe fittings for all buildings, sky, skyscrapers, for heating systems throughout the buildings, including their twins. 
And they lace the everything, they coat all their heating systems with asbestos. I knew from day one, because I heard about the New York Port Authority and the, uh, the, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey going over years in a battle of over how they were going to get rid of the get, uh, asbestos contamination in the Twin Towers. And then initially when the Twin Towers went down, I said, you know what, if I was David Rockefeller, who basically had the controlling interest, you know, before, they, before the Port Authority sold it over to Blackstone and over to Silver Streams, I said, if I was David Rockefeller, because I spent all my life studying these people from inside the belly of the beast, I said, if I was David Rockefeller, what would I do? Well, I'm not going to pay a billion dollars for scaffolding, and I'm going to go inside and spend another billion dollars to clean the damn thing up. Dresser Industries was losing billions already. They had lo the lawsuits out the yin-yang. And it wasn't until Kevin Ryan exposed the fact that Dresser Industries was absorbed in 1997, was bought out by none other than Dick Cheney, CEO for Halliburton. Halliburton bought those buildings. Then it dawns on me, Halliburton is a point man for David Rockefeller, and they got to get rid of those buildings. We're going to blow them damn things, and we're going to avoid lawsuits. And I say that unequivocally. I say that without <laughs> shuddering or shaking. I say Dick Cheney was at the helm behind 9-11. But I'm not the only one that says that. Now... I didn't go to try to arrest a criminally, uh, uh, criminally accused war criminal because I just felt like doing it so I could face six months in jail with a $5,000 fine and possibly get my ass killed. No, I didn't do it for that. I'm not that much of a fool. But I tell you, I also had a problem with where Dick Cheney was on the morning of September the 9th, or September the 11th. Well, what the conflicting time that he was in the bunker. Can we call that up? All right, what I want. Okay, he wants, I'm gonna take a second because you gotta hear this. Since I've been arrested, I've had, I've had trouble getting people to support me at first. But now we're at a point where I've got international peoples taking up my cause to come behind my court, my case. My lawyer, the former U.S. Attorney General of the, uh, of, uh, of the United States under Lyndon B. Johnson, Ramsey Clark, will be testifying at my trial. Cynthia McKinney, Congresswoman, former Congresswoman from Georgia, will, had she, she announced it to the world, I could read it to you here, but time-wise, I just got to bring this thing to a close. But Cynthia McKinney basically told almost 2,000 delegates at an anti-war crimes convention uh, tribunal in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, within the last couple of weeks, along with uh, George Galloway and Michelle Chasadowski, who's come on board with me to support. I'll be doing a talk with him in Montreal when I leave here tomorrow, flying out to Montreal. But she came out and said that she, she said that while the world is looking for some kind of judiciary process to bring these war criminals to trial, he says some people can't wait for that process to kick in because that process is not moving fast enough and people like splitting the sky, a Mohawk activist and a former leader of the American Indian movement who suffered great damages and, and imprisonment under the, uh, the COINTELPRO of the Hoover administration in the States took it upon himself to try to arrest George Bush on March the 17th. Well, you know, I tried to arrest this guy because I got the goods on him. And if we, uh, if this administration hasn't led us down the complete road to tyranny and that has completely denigrated and absolved the rule of law, then what the hell are any of us seeking redress in the form of law? then we should all be trying to get in with the next, the biggest gang going and get your peace while the whole world gets ready to go down. In other words, what's the sense of, so we don't live by the rule of law anymore. We don't live by the rule of law. We live by the rule of charity. The biggest gang with the biggest gun is the ones that control. <laughs> and 
and there are thousands of people screaming from the grave. We want justice. We were murdered. And don't go looking for the murderers in the caves in Afghanistan or in Pakistan. The murderers are right in your own backyard. The murderers are Dick Cheney, are George Bush, is the project for a new century, and all of the neoconservatives, Paul Wolfowitz, Richard Pearl, Paul Bremer, and every one of them that orchestrated this horrible, horrible massacre. Um, besides Ramsey Clark, Cynthia McKinney, Gail Davidson from Lawyers Against War. And now Gail made it very clear to me, look, Spring this guy, don't talk that 9-11 shit around me. Okay, that's your choice. But, I, but don't tell me what to say and what not to say publicly. Because I'm looking at this thing from the post-9-11 torture and murders that were committed by the Bush administration. But I'm also looking at the pre. Because I believe that the only way to stop this war on terror that was executed post 9-11, done on a bogus level, a fraudulent level, is to expose 9-11 as an inside job. Because 9-11, 9-11 truth ends 9-11 wars. Anybody agree with that? <laughs> when I was asking for people's help, I uh, called upon David Ray Griffin to uh, write up an app uh, to consider coming to testify against Dick Cheney and his timetable, the conflict of the, what, where he was on that morning. Do we have it here? All right, this is David Ray Griffin uh, has written an affidavit for my trial. He can't make it personally, but I'm going to, the first 10 minutes you're going to hear his, you're going to hear his support and an affidavit to bring Dick Cheney on trial and listen to the comments, because this is, again, prima facie evidence. If Dick Cheney was really in the time that Tim Russert and, and Richard Clark and his own photographer said he was earlier, that means Dick Cheney was responsible for letting that Pentagon get blasted, people getting killed. Dick Cheney was brought all of the air that have stood down of all the airliners in the country so no could go, air defense could go up in the air. And he also knocked out flight, he ordered Flight 93 to be taken out. Let's hear from David Ray Griffin. The following is David Ray Griffin's affidavit. This affidavit is written in support of the claims by John Boncourt that former Vice President Dick Cheney should be required to testify under oath in a court of law about his activities in relation to 9-11. In my various books on the subject, I've shown that there are many good reasons to conclude that the official story about 9-11 is false, that the 9-11 attacks were, at least in part, an inside job, and that Dick Cheney was at the center of this criminal and treasonous operation. 1. In the new Pearl Harbor, disturbing questions about the Bush administration in 9-11, 2004, I provided the summary of the various forms of evidence that the 9-11 Truth Movement had discovered at the time. I presented this summary as a prima facie argument that the 9-11 attacks had been orchestrated by Cheney, Rumsfeld, and other members of the Bush-Cheney administration. 2. In the 9-11 Commission Report, Omissions and Distortions, I showed that the 9-11 Commission report, which appears in the summer of 2004, had either distorted or simply omitted the evidence summarized in my previous book. In the follow-up essay, entitled The 9-11 Commission Report, a 571-page lie, I summarized 115 lies of omission or commission in the Commission's report that I had identified. Some of these omissions and distortions involved Cheney in particular. For example... The Commission's report omitted Secretary of Transportation Norman Mineta's testimony given to the Commission itself that Vice President Cheney and others in the underground shelter were aware by 9.26 that an aircraft was approaching the Pentagon. The Commission's report even claimed that Cheney did not reach the underground shelter, Presidential Emergency Operations Center, until 9.58 which was about 45 minutes later than the others, such as Mineta, Richard Clark, and Cheney's own photographer, said that he had gone down there. 
The commission's report claimed that Cheney did not give the shootdown authorization until after 10.10, several minutes after Flight 93 had crashed, while omitting Clark's own testimony, which suggests that he received the shootdown authorization by 9.50. I responded to four publications of 2006 intended to bolster the official's theory. One of those publications was a Vanity Fair article, 9-11 Lives, the NORAD tapes, which claimed that tapes released by NORAD in 2006 verified the claim of the 9-11 Commission report about why the military was unable to intercept the four hijacked airliners. It claimed, for example, that the military was not even notified about American 77's troubles until after it had struck the Pentagon, thereby contradicting the military's earlier report, according to which it had been notified about this flight at 924. I reported, however, what I was told by Laura Brown, the deputy in public affairs for the FAA. She had sent me a memo to the 9-11 Commission explaining that the FAA and the military had been in conversation about this flight even long before 924. This memo was read into the 9-11 Commission's record by Richard Ben Venista on May 23, 2003, where it can still be read. And yet, the Commission's report in rejecting the 924 time in favor of its own claim simply ignored this memo. Another chapter deals with a contradiction involving Cheney's longtime friend Donald Rumsfeld, who was Secretary of Defense in 2001. Whereas the 9-11 Commission report supports Donald Rumsfeld's claim that he was in his office with the CIA briefer until the Pentagon was struck so that he had no situational awareness until almost 10 o'clock. Richard Clark had reported in his best-selling book, Against All Enemies, that Rumsfeld was in the Pentagon's teleconferencing studio participating in the teleconference Clark was running from the White House from about 9.15 until the Pentagon was struck. Still another chapter deals with a similar contradiction involving General Richard Myers, who, on 9-11, was the acting chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The 9-11 Commission supported his claim that he was up on Capitol Hill that morning and that he had no idea what was going on until shortly before the Pentagon was struck. But Richard Clark had reported that Myers like Rumsfeld, was in the Pentagon's teleconferencing studio, where he had undergone conversations with Clark about what was going on. Although the official account of 9-11 claims that Osama bin Laden ordered the attacks, the FBI does not list 9-11 as one of the terrorist acts for which he is wanted, and has admitted that it has no hard evidence connecting bin Laden to 9-11. 6. The other types of reputed evidence for Muslim hijackers, such as videos of Al-Qaeda operatives at airports, passports discovered at the crash sites, and a headband discovered at the crash site of United 93, also show clear signs of having been fabricated. In addition to the absence of evidence for hijackers on the planes, there's also evidence of their absence. If hijackers had broken into the cockpits, the pilots would have squawked the universal hijack code, an act that takes only a couple of seconds. But not one of the eight pilots on the four airliners did this. Given standard operating procedures between the FAA and the military, according to which planes showing signs of an in-flight emergency are normally intercepted within about 10 minutes, Secretary of Transportation Norman Mineta reported an episode in which Vice President Cheney, while in the bunker under the White House, apparently confirmed a stand-down order at about 9.25 a.m., which was prior to the strike on the Pentagon. Another man had reported hearing members of LAX security learn that a stand-down order had come from the highest level of the White House. 10. The 9-11 Commission did not mention Mineta's report removed it from the Commission's video record of its hearings, and claimed that Cheney did not enter the shelter conference room until almost 10, which was at least 40 minutes later than he was really there, according to Mineta and several other witnesses, including Cheney's photographer. The 9-11 Commission's timeline for Cheney that morning even contradicted what Cheney himself had told Tim Russert on Meet the Press, September 16th, just five days after 9-11. 12. 
Hani Hanjur, known as a terrible pilot who could not safely fly even a single engine airplane, could not possibly have executed the amazing trajectory reportedly taken by American Flight 77 in order to hit Wedge 1 of the Pentagon. Wedge 1 would have been the least likely part of the Pentagon to be targeted by foreign terrorists for several reasons. It was as far as possible from the offices of Rumsfeld and the top brass, whom Muslim terrorists presumably would have wanted to kill. It was the only part of the Pentagon that had been reinforced. The reconstruction was not finished, so there were relatively few people there. And it was the only part of the Pentagon that would have presented obstacles to a plane's flight path. 14. Contrary to the claim of Pentagon officials that they did not have the Pentagon evacuated because they had no way of knowing that an aircraft was approaching, a military E-4B, the Air Force's most advanced communications, command and control airplane, was flying over the White House at the time. Also, although there can be no doubt about the identity of the plane, which was captured on video by CNN and others, the military had denied that it belonged to them. Mayor Rudy Giuliani told Peter Jennings of ABC News that day, we set up headquarters at 75 Barclay Street, and we were operating out of there when we were told that the World Trade Center was going to collapse. And it, the South Tower, did collapse before we could actually get out of the building. However, there was no objective basis for expecting the towers to collapse. Even the 9-11 Commission admitted that none of the fire chiefs expected them to come down. The FDNY oral histories show that the information that they were going to collapse came from the Office of Emergency Management, Giuliani's own office. How could Giuliani's people have known that the towers were going to come down unless they knew that the buildings had been laced with explosives? The official story about 9-11 is now rejected by constantly growing numbers of physicists, chemists, architects, engineers, pilots, former military officers, and former intelligence officials. To expand on the final point of that essay, during recent years, the official story has been publicly rejected by various organizations of scientists and professionals. These organizations include Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, which has over 700 licensed members, Firefighters for 9-11 Truth, Intelligence Officers for 9-11 Truth, Pilots for 9-11 Truth, Religious Leaders for 9-11 Truth, Scholars for 9-11 Truth, and Justice, which has hundreds of scientists. Scientific Panel for the Investigation of 9-11, Veterans for 9-11 Truth, which includes several former military officers, and Political Leaders for 9-11 Truth, which includes past or present members of the Parliament of Australia, Denmark, Germany, Italy, Japan, New Zealand, Norway, Pakistan, Sweden, the UK, the United States, and Europe. As these organizations show, among independent scientists and professionals in the relevant fields who have studied the evidence, the weight of scientific and professional opinions is now overwhelmingly on the side of the 9-11 truth movement. There is, in some, more than enough evidence to subpoena former Vice President Dick Cheney in order to force him to testify under oath about what really happened on 9-11, beginning with contradictions involving his own activities. Okay, so basically what he confirms is that Dick Cheney, in fact, lied about his time, where he was that morning, at the timetable. He was there earlier. It's confirmed by other people who confirm it. Peter, Scott, Peter Dale Scott later confirms it in his book, The Time That He Was Here. I also contest that Dick Cheney used his private assassination squad not only to kill uh, Bashir Bhutto, because she was telling the world that uh, Osama bin Laden had been killed years ago. He had her assassinated. But I also believe he had Tim Russert killed, because Tim Russert had the actual time, the earlier date, two days after, or four days after 9-11, on putting Cheney in the bunker at the earlier time. And, 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 and Tim Russert would have fought him tooth and nail if the commission brought to a court, along with Richard Clark, who would probably come to court, and, and his photographer. But those other two guys, I believe, are going to come up dead. But in any event, <clears throat> that's my belief. 
But where I have to go with this right now is I have where I'm at with this is that uh, Peter Dale Scott is also also offered to come and give that testimony to collaborate that. But what's happening now is that basically uh, as this as I'm the support for my trial is starting to really gain hold and people are starting to hear me for what really happened and why I'm beginning to get support from all over the world. I'm getting up support from all over the world, and I just talked to my lawyer, who's also a member of the Lawyers Against War, uh, named Charles Davison from Edmonton, and I asked him where we were at. I said, hey, when are we going to get disclosure from the Crown, and where are we at? He said, well, he tells me that we, fight, we got some video from the Crown, and that the Crown has indicated to him, thank you, have a good night. And the crown is in, and indicated to him that they 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 do not want any of Bush's misdeeds. They're going to make a motion. Any of Bush's misdeeds entered into this case. Well, what does that mean? Well, well, that's I went because of his misdeeds, because I'm accusing him of being in cahoots with Dick Cheney and many others in killing 3,000 Americans, mass murder and treason. I want a war crime tribunal. I want justice for 25 Canadians that are dead. And I want to use my courtroom as a platform to bring that truth out and to hopefully force hundreds of thousands of people through this resonation, through, this, through, this, through these technological instruments, the vision to tell the world We've got to hold them to accountability or we all die just like them. Yeah. I say we can fight this thing. I say we can beat this thing. And I say we can hold them and bring them to accountability. And I say we have to remember that we are the power. We have to remember what we can do as individuals coming together with a common vision and understanding. The truth will set us free. The truth will set us free. And what I think about this, and I'm saying no, because as far as I'm concerned, by the mere fact that they said they don't want his misdeeds brought up in court, that means they already know he's a criminal. <laughs> we already won, didn't we? In a sense. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm one of those Indians that they wished I had never learned to read. <laughs> really. And this man here and others can tell you, I read. That's all I do is read. Well, that's not all I do. But in any event, in any event, um, I am determined to fight this thing through, and I'm asking for your help. I really need your help, man. Man, woman, child, people. Um, I'm facing six months in jail, plus a $5,000 fine. If I go to jail, anything could happen. That's just the realities. But I'm, I'm willing to put my life on the line, just like I was ready to take a bullet or be tasered to death. Because I believe I really believe we're going to make a breakthrough and we're going to have a great revelation on this and they're going to have to give us somebody. They're going to have to give us Cheney and Bush, this new administration, otherwise they're going to end up showing the world that they're complicit in the ongoing cover-up of 9-11 and the mass murder and treason that happened that day. And we cannot allow ourselves to be steered away and we can't get so complicit with ourselves or apathetic and to say that that was a long time ago. No, that will never, ever, ever stop being a part of our mental conditioning, a, a part of our mental thinking process. It was designed to put us in an abject state of fear. And most of the world that saw that is living in a post-traumatic syndrome. And because of that fear that they induced that day, People are afraid 
to go up against the powers that be. But if you investigate and you look and you see and you find out that, the, that it was in fact conducted by people from the ins as an inside job, you can't believe how liberating that fact, that feeling is. How empowering it is to know that truth. And at that point, you start to deal with the psychological terror that they initiated on you. At that point, you begin to realize, hey, I know who the real terrorists are, and they are going to be held accountable. And then when you look at a trial of the KSM, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, a guy that was waterboarded 182 times to get over there and say, I, I committed the, uh, the killings of 9-11, then you know it was a kangaroo court, it's a charade, and that we have got to show, we got to get the real criminals to sit in those seats. Maybe not in a federal Manhattan court, but we are certainly going to get a contemporary Nuremberg type trial to try these people, to give them their day in court, and when they're found convicted, the people will meet out the sentences appropriate. I can't say what that'll be, but I'm sure it's not gonna be nice. It's not gonna be nice, and justice will be served. So, with that, I'm just gonna say, yeah, we're going to finish off with my song. And if you can, help me buy some of my shirts. Help me man, do some fundraising here for this court. And uh, you know what? Thank you very much for hearing me. Let's work together. Let's win. Let's win together. Let's win. We are not going to lose. We are going